Ladies and gentlemen, I would like at first to thank the Grupo de Estudios Cantianos for the very kind invitation to this conference and for the introductory words. My presentation right now is shown to you via pre-recording because I'm right now holding my weekly lecture on media philosophy. So please don't think of me as disrespectful towards the conference. This week, unfortunately, is very full on my end, so we have to do it this way, uh, because I nevertheless am very glad to be able to participate in this exciting conference. Anyway, I will join you shortly for the discussion and the presentation that I will now begin uh, will take a somewhat unorthodox approach to questions of the Copernican turn by focusing on Kant's relationship to Sigmund Freud. The particular aspects regarding such an approach are the following. Firstly, the Copernican turn can be interpreted in a very existential meaning from Freud's point of view. This perspective seems to me to be very important, especially with uh, Kant, in addition to the usual historical, epistemological and inner philosophical approaches. After all, especially in his practical philosophy, Kant was broadly concerned with conveying existential experience with transcendental structures. Furthermore, through Freud's lens, we can highlight some important aspects of Kant's own philosophy that sometimes, from my point of view, remain a bit underexposed in the reception. In this regard, I am especially talking about what Freud calls the so-called pre conscious or the unconscious. However, of course, uh, this is coined in a completely different way by Kant and is therefore not referred to as something like the unconscious or pre-conscious by him, for it was later on Schelling the, and with Schelling that this term explicitly started to play a fundamental role in the philosophical explanation of knowledge. Thirdly, the connection between Kantian philosophy and Freudianism also allows an instructive look at aspects such as the, for example, transcendental paralogism, the question of freedom, or more detailed concepts such as humility regarding the moral law, or even the mediation of nature and freedom. So you see, all of these uh, things are worthwhile synergies between Kant and Freud. So let's start, shall we? Now I will focus on the question of uh, Kant's and Freud's uh, possible mutual Copernican turn in three parts. The first part of the presentation is dedicated to a brief historical look at the relationship between Kant and Freud, especially through Neo-Kantianism. For Freud knew Kant's works and we also have his annotated exemplars of the Critique of Pure Reason. The second part of my presentation will then introduce and explain Freud's concept of a so-called narcissistic blow. Regarding Kant, we will particularly focus on Freud's concept of a so-called moral masochism in regard to this narcissistic blow. In the, first, in the third part uh, and the end, we will then relate uh, Kant's idea of a Copernican turn in philosophy to Freud's concept of a narcissistic blow and answer the question of whether this uh, Copernican turn is a narcissistic blow and a moral masochism, as Freud puts it, uh, resulting from it, or if it isn't. And then to wrap things up, I will make a quick final remark from my end uh, in the end of the presentation. So let's begin, shall we? Andrew Brook, ladies and gentlemen, has long shown in his article Kant and Freud that there are more direct references to Immanuel Kant and his work in Freud's work than to philosophers one would actually expect, namely, for example, Schopenhauer or Nietzsche. In addition, when Freud emigrated to London during his lifetime, he also took uh, um, very specific works with him, among them Kantian works, while he left many other things behind. And Brooke also shows how Neo-Kantianism in its heyday also mediated the reception of Kant by Sigmund Freud, especially through Herbart, Helmholtz or through references to Kant in Meinert or Lips. We also find comments, as I said, uh, and markings in Freud's handwritten editions of the 
critique of pure reason. Because all of this, uh, Brooks attributes the fact uh, that Freud never proposed a greater depiction of Kant from his viewpoint to the simple fact that Kant's concept of consciousness, especially conveyed by the Neo-Kantians, was so much part of the scientific mainstream during Freud's lifetime that he assumed it to be known and particular and uh, not particular popular enough by, um, by everyone anyhow. And even though there are many works that uh, pit Freud against Kant or Kant against Freud, uh, Brooks' insight is also correct in addition in the respect that there is a strong overlap between Kant and Freud, especially in their models of conscious experience. For both come to the conclusion that a large part of our cognitive ability is not directly accessible to us. In Kant's case, this applies both to theoretical philosophy, think for example of the transcendental deduction and its restriction of knowledge to the preconditioning of a conscious experience. Or uh, think of Kant's uh, practical philosophy as well, where he tells us that uh, ultimately our own actual motives when acting uh, remain always hidden for our direct, direct knowledge. Now, in his theory of the ego and its unconscious and preconscious instances, Freud starts from a very similar premise, even if he examines less the cognitive mechanism itself and more its psychological manifestation. The result, anyhow, uh, of both, namely Kant and Freud, remains similar. And this is also the point at which Freud brings up the very concept of a narcissistic blow. More on that in a moment. Alfred Tauber also points out that uh, Freud's psychoanalysis has, as well, strong Kantian traits. Freud was strongly influenced by Kant according uh, to Tauber and by Kantian influences in his conception of consciousness and its deeper structure. This is what uh, we read from Freud himself in his uh, article The Unconscious from 1915, I quote. The psychoanalytic analytic assumption of unconscious mental activity appears to us as an extension of the corrections undertaken by Kant of our views on external perception. Just as Kant warned us not to overlook the fact that our perceptions are subjectively conditioned and must not be regarded as identical with what, it, what is perceived, although unknowable, so psychoanalysis warns us not to equate perceptions by means of consciousness with the unconscious mental processes which are their object." Unquote. So you see the direct reference to Kant makes it clear here that Freud saw himself as somewhat in his tradition. Now, this is exactly where the concept of the narcissistic blow stems from. This brings us to the second part of my presentation. Based on Freud's Kantian influence, I would now like to discuss the three distinctive narcissistic blows in Sigmund Freud and his theory. According to him, they are blows to our unjustified self-aggrandizement, which is why he calls them narcissistic. And they all have to do with similar changes in the perspective uh, that we also associate with something like the so-called Copernican turn. More of that in a moment. For starters, in his influential text uh, with the title A Problem of Psychoanalysis from 1917, Freud himself begins with the so-called direct Copernican turn. I quote, The destruction, says Freud, of the narcissistic illusion that the world revolves around the globe offends us because it attacks our tendency to feel like masters of the world." Unquote. So this is the reference to Copernicus himself. After this first blow and insult to human self-love, Freud then points to the, I quote, research of Charles Darwin Unquote, from which the second narcissistic blow comes from. According to Darwin, 
humans had to realize that they were, I quote now Freud, nothing different and nothing better than animals, unquote. And they were, according to Freud, uh, offended by this insight in, again, in their narcissistic self-aggrandizement. Thus, the first and by Freud so-called cosmological blow was accompanied by a bio biological blow uh, that occurs with regard to other living beings. Now, the most sensitive blow, Freud continues, was the third, the so-called psychological blow, as he calls it. And he himself represents this blow and insult, as you could put it. For it shows people, according to Freud, that not only in relation to the world and to other beings, but also in relation to themselves, they are not masters of their own house, as Freud puts it. The ego may initially feel safe in being able to exercise insight and control over its own psyche. But, I quote Freud again, but foreign guests quickly appear in the psyche, most of whom turn out to be, as Freud says, more powerful than the ego that supposedly, supposedly controls them. According to Freud, this can be, for example, drive impulses, repressions, traumas or um, psychological illnesses. They all, uh, according to Freud, invade the ego unexpectedly. So, what he calls a blow is not that the ego cannot deal with these so-called foreign guests, but rather that they evade its anticipation and often themselves exercise unexpected control over the ego. Freud's point is that this is not a question of evil spirits or something like that or simple ex external effects, but rather, and that's the important part, but rather that parts of the same psyche interact with one another. And we only have a conscious and active access to very few of those parts. That's why Freud says, I quote, nothing foreign, foreign has entered you. A part of your own mental life has escaped your knowledge and the control of your will, unquote. Now, according to him, this insight into the limitations of our own mental structure humiliates us deeply. And Freud does not only use terminology that is uh, decidedly similar to Kantianism to describe these things, but also refers to Arthur Schopenhauer, whose interpretation of Kant went in a very similar direction. And on top of that, that's the important part now, on top of that, and from a systematic rather than a philological point of view, the whole approach of an essential self-limitation and self-limitedness of human cognitive abilities reminds us, of course, strikingly of Kant. What Kant calls the restriction of knowledge to experience appears in Freud as the conscious ego that remains at the mercy of, a, of an, what he calls ocean of unconsciousness. Particularly worth mentioning here is Kant's doctrine of the paralogism of pure reason. In it, reason forms the idea of itself as the ultimate and supreme mental subject of all knowledge and experience. And this idea is rejected by Kant from, a, from transcendental uh, logical means with arguments similar to those by Freud. We have neither an immediate nor a complete experience of our so own subjectivity, Kant points out. And this restriction is also expressed in practical philosophy. As Kant, very similar to Freud, pointed out several times. He says, in our actions, we can never be sure whether we are acting out of actual insight in our own will, that is, out of the categorical imperative, or out of self-love and act on mere hypothetical imperatives. We can never completely know for sure, according to Kant. And in this respect, Freud and Kant can definitely brought into, be brought into agreement. But what is even more important is the conclusion they both draw from this. While Freud speaks of a narcissistic blow that rains down on us from it, Kant, on his end, speaks of a Copernican turn towards empowerment and encouragement of the subject by this. <laughs> 
For Kant, the restriction of the cognitive faculty to the conditions of the uh, possibility of experience and to the following limitation of reason lead exactly to the Com Copernican conclusion that reason does not remain in a blow, but rather finds itself in incited to establish itself in reality by such blows. So, precisely because reason experiences and explores its own limits, this limitation gives reason a mandate to act, which it takes up as an ability, mainly in practical philosophy, of ought, as a duty and as an imperative of the moral law. The Copernican turn is a turn towards the subject capable of action, and it is capable of action precisely because this subject experiences its own restrictions and limitations by evaluating itself, just as Freud does. As much as reason encounters limits in the theoretical field in Kant, it empowers itself to act on the practical field. For the humiliation and finitude of rational subjects leads, according to Kant, directly to the question, what should I do now? What should we do with our own limitations as soon as we experience them? The more I understand my own limits and how I deal with them, and even exceed them through action, the more I learn and grow, and the more capable I become of acting with Kant. And exactly at this point, another bridge is built between Kant and Freud, in that Freud summarizes what has, has just been said about Kant in his own concept of a psychoanalytic therapy. In psychoanalysis, therapy has precisely the purpose of getting to you to know your own limitations, dealing with them and being able to use them to empower yourself. Psychoanalysis pursues, in this regard, the same project as Kant does. Now, if anything, it is this approach of psychoanalysis that must be brought into connection with something like a Copernican turn. The Copernican turn is not a narcissistic blow, but rather an empowerment in the face of a narcissistic blow that has already taken place. It is the recognition that it is reason itself that offends itself, just as Freud puts it, reason is, reason is offending itself and thereby provokes itself into the ability to act. From Freud's point of view, it is all the more important to learn to recognize this blow as a blow in order to be able to deal with the nature of one's own psyche. In Kant's terminology, this is expressed in the concept of the so-called respect for the moral law. From this perspective, Kant and Freud speak with one voice and the answer to the question of our title is no. The Copernican turn is not a narcissistic blow, but already the remedy for the experience of such a blow. That's the whole point. And that's where Freud and Kant agree. But based on this, and to come to my final remarks, it is all the more surprising that Freud famously interprets Kant rather differently. In his essay, The Economic Problem of Masochism, Freud distinguishes between several forms of masochism, which by definition make pain and unrest their purpose. Among them, Freud knows a so-called moral masochism as the deepest form of a self-inflicted harm, which is quite comparable to the narcissistic blow. Now, the main representative of such a moral masochism, directly cited by Freud in this text, is Immanuel Kant, with the concept of a categorical imperative. In moral masochism, everything depends on seeing meaning in suffering, so Freud, and not even needing an external cause for this suffering, but rather gaining it from one's own mental life. So according to Freud, this creates a direct need for punishment, that's Freud's term, a direct need for punishment in humans, which is why the so-called masochist constructs and continues to construct an unattainable concept of morality that he is 
as a finite being never able to satisfy. Morality thus becomes a construction and illusion based on our masochistic needs for punishment, according to Freud. In this regard, Freud warns uh, against the moral masochism and thus against, from his point of view, Kant's moral concept as a seemingly self-destructive force. Such a masochism, according to Freud, therefore requires therapy. And in fact, I think and I would say, Kantianism can learn a lot from this Freudian perspective in order not to understand the moral law as a tyrant, which is very often done, I think, in, the, in, in Kant's perception. But conversely, Freud very much shortened Kant as well and reduced him in interpreting morality, especially the categorical imperative, as somewhat a, of a masochistic attack by reason on itself. For, to implement the concept of a Copernican turn once again, for as a Copernican, Copernican turn, and with Kant, an active and empowered morality has exactly, exactly the same function that psychoanaly psychoanalytic therapy brings with it, according to Freud. So, morality and psychoanalytic therapy are the same thing for the both of two. That's my proposal, at least. And at least in this respect, Freud and Kant speak with one voice and therefore both speak of an, an empowering and freedom-carrying Copernican turn, which is much more than just a narcissistic blow to human self-aggrandizement. Thank you very much. <laughs>